will hear an address by His Excellency, the Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and President of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency, the Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and President of the Palestinian Authority, and I ask him to address the Assembly. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Mr. President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I extend my congratulations to His Excellency, Mr. Nasser Abdul Aziz Al Nasser, on his assumption of the presidency of the Assembly for this session, and I wish him every success. Today, I extend my sincere congratulations on behalf of the Palestine Liberation Organization and the Palestinian people to the government and people of South Sudan for its deserved admission as a full member of the United Nations, wishing them progress and prosperity. I also congratulate the Secretary General his Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, for his election to a new term at the helm of the United Nations. This renewal of confidence reflects the world's appreciation for his efforts, which have strengthened the role of the United Nations. Excellencies, the question of Palestine is intricately linked with the United Nations via the resolutions adopted by its various organs and agencies and through the essential and lauded role of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East UNRWA, which embodies the international responsibility toward the, pl the plight of Palestine's refugees, who are the victims of Al-Nakba, the catastrophe that occurred in 1948. We aspire for and seek a greater and more effective role for the United Nations in working to achieve a just and comprehensive peace in our region that ensures the inalienable, legitimate national rights of the Palestinian people as defined by the resolutions of international legitimacy embodied by the United Nations. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, at the same time, and in this hall, distinguished leaders and heads of delegations addressed the stalled peace effort in our region. Everyone had high hopes for a new round of final status negotiations. 
which had begun in early September in Washington under the direct auspices of President Obama and with the participation of the International Quartet as well as Egypt and Jordan to reach within one year a peace agreement. We entered those negotiations with open hearts and attentive ears and sincere intentions and we were ready with our documents, our papers and our proposals. But these negotiations broke down just weeks after they were launched. After this, we did not give up and we did not cease our efforts for initiatives and contacts. Over the past year, we did not leave a door to be knocked or channel to be pursued or path to be taken and we did not ignore any formal or informal party of influence and stature to be addressed. We positively considered the various ideas and proposals and initiatives presented from many countries and parties. But all of these sincere efforts and endeavors undertaken by international parties were repeatedly smashed against the rock of the positions of the Israeli government, which quickly, quickly dashed the hopes raised by the launch of negotiations last September. The core issue here is that the Israeli government refuses to commit to terms of reference for the negotiations that are based on international law and UN resolutions. And it frantically continues to intensify building settlements on the territory of the state of the future state of Palestine. Settlement activities embody the core of a policy of colonial military occupation of the land of the Palestinian people and all of the brutality of aggression and racial discrimination against our people that this policy entails. This policy, which constitutes a breach of international humanitarian law and UN resolutions, is the primary cause for the failure of the peace process, the collapse of dozens of opportunities and the burial of the great hopes that arose from the signing of the Declaration of Principles in 1993 between the Palestine Liberation Organization and Israel to achieve a just peace that would begin a new era for our region. The reports of United Nations missions, as well as reports by several Israeli institutions and civil societies convey a horrific picture about the size of the settlement campaign, which the Israeli government does not hesitate to boast about and which it continues to execute through the systematic confiscation of the Palestinian lands and the construction of thousands of new settlement units in various areas of the West Bank, particularly in the Arab part of Jerusalem and throughout the West Bank and through the accelerated construction of the racist annexation wall that is eating up large tracts of our land, dividing it into separate and isolated islands and cantons, destroying family life and communities and harming the livelihoods of tens of thousands of families. The occupying power also continues to refuse issuing permits for our people to build in occupied East Jerusalem. And at the same time, it intensifies its decades-long campaign of the demolition and confiscation of homes displacing Palestinian owners and residents under a multi-pronged policy of ethnic cleansing aimed at pushing them away from their ancestral homeland. Moreover, matters have reached a point where orders have been issued to deport elected representatives from the city, their city of Jerusalem. 
the occupying power also continues to undertake excavations that threaten our holy places and its military checkpoints prevent our citizens from gaining access to their mosques and churches. It continues to besiege the holy city with a ring of settlements and with the annexation wall imposed to separate the holy city from the rest of the Palestinian cities. The occupation is racing against time to redraw the borders on our land according to what it wants and to impose a fait accompli on the ground that changes the realities and undermines the, the realistic potential for the rise of the state of Palestine. At the same time, the occupying power continues to impose a strict blockade on the Gaza Strip and to target Palestinian civilians by assassinations, airstrikes, artillery shelling, persisting with its war of aggression of three years ago on the Strip, which resulted in the massive destruction of homes, schools, hospitals, and mosques, and thousands of martyrs and wounded. The occupying power also continues its incursions in areas of the Palestinian National Authority through raids, arrests, and killings at the checkpoints. In recent years, the criminal actions of armed settler militias who enjoy the special protection of the occupation army, these actions have intensified with the perpetration of frequent attacks against our people, targeting their homes, schools, universities, mosques, fields, crops, and trees. Today, they killed one Palestinian who was peacefully protesting. Despite our repeated warnings, the occupying, the Israeli authorities have not acted to curb these acts, and we hold them fully responsible for the crimes of the settlers. These are but a few examples of the policy of the Israeli colonial settlement occupation, and this policy is responsible for the repeated failure of successive international attempts to salvage the peace process. This policy will destroy the chances of achieving a two-state solution upon which there is an international consensus. And here, I caution, and I caution aloud, the set this settlement policy threatens to also undermine the structure of the Palestinian National Authority and even end its existence. In addition, we now face the imposition of new conditions that have not previously been raised, conditions that will transform the raging conflict in our inflamed region into a religious conflict and a threat to the future of a million and a half Palestinians, citizens of Israel, a matter which we reject and which is impossible for us to accept, to accept being dragged to. All of the actions taken by Israel in our country are a series of unilateral actions that are not that aim to entrench occupation. Israel has re-established the administrative and military authority in the West Bank with a unilateral decision, and it decided that its military authorities are the ones that determine the right of any of the citizens on whether to reside in any area of Palestinian land. And Israel is the one that decides to confiscate our land and our water and to obstruct our movement as well as the movement of goods unilaterally. And yet they speak of unilateralism. 
despite our agreements. And these agreements forbid unilateral individual actions. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1974, our deceased leader, Yasser Arafat, came to this hall and assured And he assured the members of the General Assembly of our affirmative pursuit for peace. He urged the United Nations to realize the inalienable national rights of the Palestinian people. And he said, do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. Do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. In 1988, President Arafat again addressed the General Assembly, which convened in Geneva to hear him. There, he submitted the Palestinian peace program adopted by the Palestine National Council at its session held that same year in Algeria. When we adopted this program, we were taking a painful and very difficult step for all of us especially those, including myself, who were forced to leave their homes and their towns and their villages, carrying only some of our belongings and our grief and our memories and the keys to our homes, to camps of exile and diaspora in the 1948 Al-Nakba. In one of the worst operations, of uprooting, destruction, and removal of a vibrant and cohesive society that had been contributing in a pioneering and leading way in the cultural, educational, and economic renaissance of the Arab Middle East. Yet, because we believe in peace, and because of our conviction in international legitimacy, and because we had the courage to make difficult decisions for our people, and in the absence of absolute justice, we decided to adopt the path of relative justice, justice that is possible, a justice that could correct part of the grave historical injustice committed against our people. Thus, we agreed to establish the state of Palestine on only 22% of the territory of historical Palestine, on all the Palestinian territory occupied by Israel in 1967. We, by taking that historic step, which was welcomed by the states of the world, made a major concession in order to achieve a historic compromise that would allow peace to be made in the land of peace. In the years that followed, from the Madrid Conference and the Washington negotiations leading to the Oslo Agreement, which was signed 18 years ago in the White House Garden and was linked with the letters of mutual recognition, mutual recognition between the Palestine Liberation Organization and Israel, we persevered and dealt positively and responsibly with all efforts aimed at the establishment of a lasting peace agreement. Yet, as we said earlier, every initiative and every conference and every new round of negotiations and every movement was shattered on the rock of the Israeli settlement expansion project. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I confirm on behalf of the Palestine Liberation Organization, the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, which will remain so until the end of the conflict in all its aspects and until the resolution of all final status issues, I affirm the following. Number one, the goal of the Palestinian people is the realization of their inalienable national rights, 
and their independent state of Palestine, with East Jerusalem as its capital on all the land of the West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, which Israel occupied in the June 1967 war, in conformity with the resolutions of international legitimacy and with the achievement of a just and agreed-upon solution to the Palestine refugee issue in accordance with Resolution 194, as stipulated in the Arab Peace Initiative, which presented the consensus Arab and Islamic vision to resolve the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict and to achieve a just and comprehensive peace that we are committed to and work towards. To this, we adhere. And achieving this desired peace also requires the release of political prisoners and the prisoners of freedom and Palestinian detainees in Israeli prisons without delay. Number two. The Palestine Liberation Organization and the Palestinian people adhere to the renouncement of violence and rejection and condemnation of terrorism in all its forms, especially state terrorism. Especially state terrorism and the terrorism by settlers. And we adhere to all agreements signed between the PLO and Israel. Third, we adhere to the option of negotiating a lasting solution to the conflict in accordance with resolutions of international legitimacy. Here, I declare that the PLO is ready to return immediately to the negotiating table on the basis of the adopted terms of reference based on international legitimacy and the complete cessation of settlement activity. Fourth. Our people will continue their popular peaceful resistance to the Israeli occupation. Will continue their popular peaceful resistance to the Israeli occupation and its settlement and apartheid policies and its construction of the racist annexation wall. And they receive support for their resistance which is consistent with international humanitarian law and international conventions and has the support of peace activists from Israel and around the world, reflecting an impressive, inspiring, and courageous example of the strength of this defenseless people armed only with their dreams, courage, hope, and slogans in the face of bullets, tanks, tear gas, and bulldozers. Fifth, when we bring our plight and our case to this international podium, it is a confirmation of our reliance on the political and diplomatic option and is a confirmation that we do not undertake unilateral steps. Our efforts are not aimed at isolating Israel or delegitimizing it. Rather, we want to gain legitimacy for the cause of the people of Palestine. We only aim to delegitimize the settlement activities, the occupation and apartheid and the logic of ruthless force, and we believe that all the countries of the world stand with us in this regard. I am here to say on behalf of the Palestinian people and the Palestine Liberation Organization, we extend our hands to the Israeli government and the Israeli people for peacemaking. I say to them, let us urgently build together a future for our children where they can enjoy freedom, security and prosperity. Let us build the bridges of dialogue instead of checkpoints and walls of separation. Let us build cooperative relations based on parity and equity and friendship between two neighboring states, Palestine and Israel, instead of policies of occupation, settlement, war, and eliminating the other. 
Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, despite the unquestionable right of our people to self-determination and to the independence of our state, as stipulated in international resolutions, we have accepted in the past few years to engage in what appeared to be a test of our worthiness, entitlement, and eligibility. During the last two years, our national authority has implemented a program to build our state institutions. Despite the extraordinary situation and the Israeli obstacles imposed on us, a serious, extensive project was launched that has included the implementation of plans to enhance and advance the judiciary, the apparatus for the maintenance of order and security, the development of administrative, financial, and oversight systems, upgrading the performance of institutions, and enhancing self-reliance in order to reduce the need for foreign aid. With the thankful support of Arab countries and donors from friendly countries, a number of large infrastructure projects have been implemented, focused on various aspects of services with special attention to rural and marginalized areas. In the midst of this massive national project, we have been strengthening what we sought to be the features of our state our future state, from the preservation of security for the citizen and public order to the promotion of judicial authority and the rule of law to strengthening the role of women via legislation, laws, and participation to ensuring the protection of public freedoms and strengthening the role of civil society institutions to institutionalizing rules and regulations for ensuring accountability and transparency in the work of our ministries and departments to entrenching the pillars of democracy as the basis for the Palestinian political life. When division struck the unity of our homeland, our people and our institutions, we were determined to adopt dialogue for re the restoration of our unity. We succeeded months ago in achieving national reconciliation and we hope that its implementation will be accelerated in the coming weeks. The core pillar of this reconciliation was to turn to the people through legislative and presidential elections to be conducted within a year, because the state we want will be a state characterized by the rule of law, the exercise of democracy, and the protection of freedoms and equality of all citizens without any discrimination and the transfer of power through the ballot box. The reports issued recently by the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund we believe have confirmed and loaded what has been accomplished and have considered it a remarkable and unprecedented model. The consensus conclusion of the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee of Donor Countries a few days ago here in this city described what has been accomplished as, quote, a remarkable international success story, unquote, and confirmed the readiness of the Palestinian people and their institutions for the in immediate independence of the state of Palestine. That was the statement of the international community. I do not believe that anyone with a shred of conscience can reject our application for a full membership in the United Nations and our admission as an independent state.
سيد الرئيس أيها السادة Mr. President, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is no longer possible to redress the issue of the blocked horizon of the peace talks with the same means and methods that have repeatedly been tried and proven unsuccessful over the past years. The crisis is far too deep to be neglected, and it is far more dangerous to be simply circumvented or its explosion postponed. It is neither possible nor practical nor acceptable to return to conducting business as usual as if everything is fine. It is futile to go into negotiations without clear parameters and in the absence of credibility and a specific timetable. Negotiations will be meaningless as long as the occupation army on the ground continues to entrench its occupation instead of rolling it back and continues to change the demography of our country in order to create a new basis on which to alter the borders. This is totally unacceptable. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment of truth. Our people are waiting to hear the answer of the world. Will it allow Israel to continue the last occupation in the world? We are the last people to remain under occupation. Will the world allow Israel to occupy us forever? And will it allow Israel to remain a state above the law and accountability? Will it allow Israel to continue rejecting the resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly of the United Nations and the International Court of Justice and the positions of the overwhelming majority of countries in the world? Is this acceptable? Mr. President, the heart of the crisis in our area is very, very simple and obvious. Either there is those who believe that we are an unnecessary people, unwanted people in the Middle East, or those who believe that, in fact, there is a missing state that needs to be established immediately. Mr. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I come before you today from the Holy Land, the land of Palestine, the land of divine messages, ascension of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the birthplace of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, to speak on behalf of the Palestinian people in the homeland and in the diaspora, to say after 63 years of suffering of an ongoing tragedy, al Nakba, enough. Enough, enough. It is time for the Palestinian people to gain their freedom and independence. The time has come to end the suffering and the plight of millions of Palestinian refugees in the homeland and the diaspora to end their displacement and to realize their rights, some of whom were forced to take refuge more than once in different places of the world. At a time when the Arab peoples affirm their quest for democracy in what is called now the Arab Spring, the time has come also for the Palestinian Spring, the time for independence. <laughs> The time has come for our men, women, and children to live normal lives. For them to be able to sleep without waiting for the worst that the next day will bring. For mothers to be assured that their children will return home without fear of being killed, arrested, or humiliated. For students to be able to go to their schools and universities 
without checkpoints obstructing them. The time has come for sick people to be able to reach hospitals normally and for our farmers to be able to take care of their good land without fear of the occupation seizing the land and its water, which the wall prevents access to, or the fear of the settlers with their guard dogs who attack the Palestinians. They build on our lands their homes and uproot and burn the olive trees that have existed in Palestine for hundreds of years. The time has come for the thousands of prisoners of conscience and freedom to be released from the prisons, to return to their families and their children, to become a part of building their homeland for the freedom of which they have sacrificed so much. My people desire to exercise their right to enjoy a normal life like the rest of humanity. They believe in what our great poet Mahmoud Darwish said, standing here, standing here, staying here, permanent here, eternal here, and we have one goal, one goal, one goal, to be, and we shall be. Ladies and gentlemen, we profoundly appreciate and value the positions of all states that have supported our struggle and our rights and recognize the state of Palestine following the Declaration of Independence in 1988, as well as the countries that have recently recognized the state of Palestine and those that have upgraded the level of Palestine's representation in their capitals. I also salute the, the Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who said a few days ago a word of truth, that the Palestinian state should have been established years ago. Be assured that this support for our people is more valuable to them than you can imagine. For it makes them feel that someone is listening to their narrative and that and does not try to ignore their tragedy and the horrors of Al Nakba and the occupation from which they have so suffered and it reinforces their hope that stems from the belief that justice is possible in this world. For the loss of hope is the most ferocious enemy of peace, and despair is the strongest ally of extremism. I say, the time has come for my courageous and proud people, after decades of displacement and colonial occupation and ceaseless suffering, to live like other peoples of the earth, free in a sovereign and independent homeland. Mr. President, I would like to inform you that before delivering this statement, I, in my capacity as President of the State of Palestine, and Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization submitted to His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations, an application for the admission of Palestine on the basis of the borders of June 4, 1967 with Al-Quds al-Sharif as its capital as a full member of the United Nations. Thank you.
This is a copy of the application. I call upon Mr. Secretary General to expedite transmittal of our request to the Security Council. And I call upon the distinguished members of the Security Council to vote in favor of our full membership. I also appeal to the states that have not yet done so to recognize the state of Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, the support of the countries of the world for our endeavor is a victory for truth, freedom, justice, law, and international legitimacy. And it provides tremendous support for the peace option and enhances the chances of success of the negotiations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, your support for the establishment of the State of Palestine and for its admission to the United Nations as a full member is the greatest contribution to peacemaking in the land of peace and throughout the world. Mr. President, I have come here today carrying a message from a courageous and proud people. Palestine is being reborn. This is my message. May all the people of the world stand with the people of Palestine as it marches steadfastly to its appointment with history, with freedom, with independence right now. And I hope that we shall not wait for long. Thank you all. We shall now continue the general debate. The Assembly will hear a statement by His Excellency Yoshihiko Noda, Prime Minister of Japan, 